What's up internet, my name is Michael Cook, this is Blue Giant Media, and we're here to connect through gaming. Today we're going to take a look at Merlin and its many different expansions, modules, and promos and good stuff. We're going to set the game up in real time, so be prepared, it's going to take a while. If you want to skip some of the sections that you don't have, take a look in the description section because I'm going to try and put links there that kind of jump through to the setup components for the different modules that you may or may not have. Then I'm going to go ahead and play through. Um, a couple turns of play. I can't even get through a couple rounds because there's a lot of things to get through, but hopefully it'll give you a good idea of how to set the game up, how to play through the game, and maybe a little bit of whether you're going to enjoy this game or not. So without further ado, let's ready, set, play. All right, so Merlin is a worker placement uh, rondelle based game where you're going to be moving your knight around a circle through different principalities and doing all kinds of different actions to basically be the best knight of the round table. So I'm going to be setting this game up for two players and I'm going to set it up kind of in stages so you can follow along with me taking into account kind of what expansions you have. I'll be setting up first the base game and then I'll make changes to uh, what changes to, for Arthur. Then I'll add in Queenie 1, Queenie 2, and Merlin Knights of the Round Table. After I've done all that, then I'll go ahead and uh, actually go through a couple rounds of play. And I'm gonna try and see if I can put some timestamps down below so that once you kind of get through the, you know, whatever combination of things that you have from expansions and promos and all that, then you can, uh, jump to the actual gameplay sample and watch a little bit of how the game is going to be played. So, with that in mind, let's go ahead and set the game up. I'm going to set aside quite a few things now because I'm going to set up for the base game. So this is only going to be used for Arthur, so we're going to set that to the side. These are also only used for Arthur. Arthur. Uh, well, this is only used for Arthur. This is just a place to put your different quest cards, so you can use this either way, whether you're using that expansion material or not. And either way, we're going to set up the board and we'll go ahead and put this right about there. That looks good. Okay, each player, and we'll also set these aside also for Arthur. Each player is going to get their player boards, then um, I'll set that aside for now as well. It's part of a module, and that's part of an expansion. So each player is going to get their player board, and they are going to get their four henchmen, which they're gonna go ahead and place on the corresponding spaces on their board. Then they're going to get their you know, pawn, you can set aside the black, oh, I will set aside the black die for now because that's only in the Arthur expansion. For right now, you will have these seals in your game, but they are used with a, um, an, a module that kind of comes in the game that you can choose to play with or not. So I'm gonna set them aside for now. We will get to them later. You're gonna take your score marker, put it over there on the one, hundred or zero space. Okay, you're gonna take your influence and put them right there. You can go ahead and put your dice in there, your Merlin staffs on there, and you can set your manners and your um, 100 token off to the side. We'll be adding a couple more things over here later in the game, or later in the setup, but we'll get to that. All right, and then we'll do the same thing over here. I'm gonna go ahead and move the seals and the black die off to the side. I'm going to move the manners and the score token to the side. All right, got our influence. Gonna put our score marker out. Got our dice. Got our different henchmen. 
and there we go. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and open this bag. We're gonna grab all the different quest cards. You're going to shuffle them up better than I'm going to right now. And you're gonna go ahead and set them right there. And you're gonna flip over three of them. And this is where I'm just gonna set this here for now because it's kind of inconsequential for you. That's where they will go eventually. Okay, now it's time to start putting out all these different bits. So, got a lot of stuff here. We're gonna, at, in each of these six principalities, we are going to put the corresponding flags, the corresponding shields, and the corresponding building resources. So each of these flags is going to give different abilities that let you break the rules or use your dice differently or move differently throughout the game, among a, a couple other things, I guess. So for instance, this blue one, the blue flag, is going to allow you to move counterclockwise. Is that gonna focus? There we go. Let's you move counterclockwise around the circle, whereas you're usually only going to be going clockwise. The purple flag there allows you to flip one of your dice over before using it, meaning you can turn a one to a six, six to a one, two to a five, five to two, etc. Then that orange flag that I just put out there, that one allows you to um, use the space after you move uh, use the space that one of your opponents is occupying. So either maybe your opponent blocked you or maybe your opponent's on the other side of the circle, which is kind of doing, and, and on a space that you want to utilize, but it's really far away. Well, you can go ahead and use an orange flag and you can move and no matter where you are, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna do what their position says. This brown flag allows you to move across the circle. Uh, it says that you're supposed to move the number of pips and then move across the circle. Uh, there's very rare circumstances where it's going to matter whether you move before uh, across the circle before or after, but it it can matter because you are going to be jumping over uh, other pawns. So if you were to move and then cross, then you might be in a you'll you'll be off possibly a space or so. All right, the black flag right there allows you to get rid of one of your uh, stacks of traders. You're going to be getting different traders that are you're going to have to deal with every couple of rounds because every scoring round is or scoring rounds are every other round. And each of those scoring rounds you're going to be dealing with three traders, but they could be two of them on the same space. What this lets you do is choose one color of these six at the top and get rid of all the traders of that type. So you might get lucky and get rid of more than one. And then this gray flag, the last one over here, is going to allow you to complete two quests in the same turn. Normally you can only complete one quest. That allows you to complete, complete two quests in the same turn. And if you do, then you are going to get a two point bonus, which is basically like completing three quests in the same turn, which can be a lot of points. All right, so we're all set up there. Now we're gonna go ahead and grab the traders that I was telling you about. We'll go ahead and mix them up and grab three of them for each player. So here we got an orange, a blue, and a brown. And over here, this player is going to have a blue, orange, and gray. All the rest of these, you're gonna go ahead and stack them up on the corner of the board with their silhouettes on them. There we go. Okay. Now, we are going to grab the first player, Crown, which is, let's put there for the moment. 
I'm going to grab all these apples and put them right there. We're going to grab Merlin and we're going to put him on the dragon principality, the black principality over there. Then we have, this is the round tracker. And it looks like we're all set there. And then the last thing that we're going to do is set up our environs, the environment over here, which is where we're going to be building. And it's got some area control elements to it. There's spaces on the board that when you move your, um, your worker onto them, you're going to be able to spend resources and depending on what resource or building uh, material you use, you're going to be able to build a manor on one of those axes. So you're going to take out in a two or three player game, which I'm setting up a two player game, you're going to take out one of each color of the hexes with and without a tower and you will set them aside. Okay, the rest of them, you're going to go ahead, mix them all up, and set them out. You want this to be random because this is, as I said, a bit of an area control element to the game. The larger area of the same color there is, the more valuable that area is going to be. So you don't want to kind of influence what's going to happen one way or the other. So go ahead and keep it random. Try not to pay any attention or influence what comes out. And there we are. Okay, now we are just about set up. We're going to grab Excalibur, put it on the space right here, and the Holy Grail and put it on that space right there. Then each player is going to get one of these that is going to indicate where they're starting and what resources they're going to have. So we've got those two and each player will also then get four quests. One, two, three, four. All right. And these will normally be kept secret, but I'm going to go ahead and flip them over so that we can see what's going on. All right, now let's look at these different start tiles that we've got here. So this shows that this player is gonna start in brown and they'll start with a brown flag. They're gonna get an orange shield, a purple building resource and influence in blue. This one right here says they're gonna start in purple and they're gonna get a blue shield, a gray resource and an influence in black. So we can go ahead and set those out. Like that, get a purple flag. and a blue shield, which is nice because we have a blue trader that's going to allow us to block that trader. We're going to get a gray building resource and we're going to take one of our influence tokens and we're going to put it in black. And I also, each player is supposed to get an apple to start the game. So apple, four quest cards and everything shown on here along with all of your color pieces. Over here, this player will start on the brown they're going to get an orange shield, and these are somewhat determined by what's kind of coming around the circle. So as you can see, I started here, so I got one of those uh, shields, one of those resources, and one of those influence. So it kind of moves back because you can only move clockwise, so you kind of get a benefit of the places that you're not going to reach for as long. All right. Anyway, we've got our orange shield, which again is good, helps us out. A purple resource, or I keep saying resource, but they're building materials, and an influence in blue. After that, these are no longer needed. Grab that brown flag and put it there. Okay, now we are set up for the base game. So I'm now going to move on to add the module that comes in the base game. This is really pretty simple. All we're going to do is we'll go ahead and slide our boards down. Actually, no, we'll keep them up. And we'll put this below our boards. Okay. 
And what these do, now we will have our seals, is when we finish a quest, instead of getting the points for the quest, we have the option up to four times in the game to put down one of these seals on the board here. So as you can see, each quest is going to have, I'm sorry, the lighting's not wanting to catch these. There we go. So you've got the cost up here, which isn't doesn't mean you're going to lose that. That's just what you have to have in order to complete, complete the quest. The number of points you'll get up in the corner, which is also the level of the quest, and what kind of henchman it's related to. This is your shield bear, which gets you shields. So when you finish this quest, you can go onto the shield bearer uh, column here, and you can go ahead and since it was a level two quest, you could either cover this one space or the level two space, giving you a benefit for the rest of the game. If I were to cover up the one space, for the rest of the game, anytime you complete a quest that has uh, that particular henchman on it, you're gonna get an addi additional point. And it's the same thing for the level one of all of these. Level two is also the same for all of these. Uh, what this one says is whenever you move onto one of the principality spaces, which are the colored spaces that allow you to interact with a principality by sending one of your henchmen, that you can choose to send that particular henchman to somewhere other than where you are. So instead of putting him in purple because I'm in purple, I can send him to any of the different places. And then the bottom row of each of these is going to give um, a one-time use special ability. So you can take this and then you can flip it over to show that you've used the ability. This one lets you put out two manners. This one gets rid of some traders. This one lets you trade in resources and or for um, victory points. And this one lets you um, put henchmen out where you've got influence or something like that. So there's, those are all one-time use things. So that is that module. Now we're going to move over to Queenie number one. So Queenie number one is going to involve the uh, environs here. And what it does, you see I've got these right here. It comes with these, which are going to replace the blank environs spaces. So just like before, we're going to remove, we've got one set of each color of those that we're going to leave out and we're going to get one set of each color of the queenie ones to leave out and we'll go ahead and set these aside and we will then take all of the regular pieces that are boring and don't do anything special and we will set them into this little box here where I'm just not going to utilize them. Then we'll do the same thing. We'll mix all of these up and place them out. So we'll go ahead and do this, mix everything up, and start flipping these over. So what these do is when you get a chance to put a building, uh, one of your manors out, which um, it happens when you land on this space, where it's got the little manor with an arrow down to the hex, so I could spend a black resource cube to build a manor on any of the cubes or hexagons that are kind of shooting out from that space. So depending on what building resource you have at your disposal, you may or may not be able to build on the hex that you want to build on. Now, you will score points in each of the scoring rounds, which are at the end of the second and the uh, fourth and the sixth rounds, the even numbered rounds. You're gonna score points based off the size of the area that you control. So if you control an area of three because you got one and your opponent has none of the spaces occupied by a manor, you'll get three points. But now, in addition to having that area control aspect, now you've got all these different bonuses. So when you, normally you've only got the towers, which when you go there, you get to take any influence where, you know, putting an influence where you want, grabbing any flag that you want, or grabbing any shield that you want. Now you have the ability to get a point and an apple, to take Excalibur, to get an extra Merlin staff, which now we will go ahead and bring those out and set them, well, we'll just set them right here for now, um, to be able to look where you've got an influence and get a shield and a building resource, to be able to make an opponent, all your opponents lose a shield or a building resource. So you just got a lot more fun things that you can do rather than just control out here. Okay, so that is Queenie 
number one. So the next one that I'm gonna bring out is going to be Queenie number two. And this is another one um, that's relatively simple and I like it quite a bit. So what it's going to come with is some of these different ways that are gonna tell you how you can utilize your uh, decrees, which is what this is. Come on. So it says on here that you're going to be able to turn in one decree that you have gotten to increase or decrease a die roll by one, and you can turn in two decrees that you've gotten to take any resource of one of the th four types that you want, or you can turn in three of them and just get five points. So what do these do and how do you get them? They're going to give you either points, um, shields, flags, building resources, uh, uh, building materials, I mean, it's all the different things that you can get out there. But the catch is they're going to be randomized and mixed up so whenever you go to one of the different principalities, instead of, and you send a henchman to do an action there, instead of doing that particular henchman's action, you can grab a decree, which it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You're getting something that you may not know what it, oh, well, you don't know what it is. It may not be super useful, but maybe you don't need any purple stuff. None of that is what you need. So, well, might as well grab a decree because in addition to being able to get something that could possibly be from all the way across the circle and might be a little bit hard to get access to, uh, you can also turn these in to get different bonuses. Like I said, after you've collected one of them, you're gonna set it to the side and when you want to, you will spend them. And you can spend one of them to increase or decrease the die roll. You can use two of them to take any one resource that you want. So basically, if you've taken two decrees, you're going to get two resources that you may or may not have needed and one that you need for sure. So it's definitely more effective. So they can be pretty interesting and they are also very simple to add in. All right, and that is all that you need for Queenie number two. All right, so now that we've talked about the Queenies, we're gonna move on to the expansions. So Arthur, first off, I'm going to talk about the different spaces that we're going to cover up here so that people who don't have Arthur aren't gonna miss out on the very few things that are actually replaced here. Um, this one right here allows you to uh, turn in two of your quest cards for two of the ones that are showing out here. So you can swap out two of the ones that you don't like and get two that hopefully are gonna be more helpful for you. Other than that, all the other different spaces are going to be represented in one way or another, except for, I think it's that one. No, that one's still here too. So yeah, I think everything else is pretty much gonna be the same because this other stuff that moves off of the, uh, the outer rondelle is now gonna be part of the inner rondelle. It also comes with a stand-up round marker, a new round tracker, because now, in addition to the other things that we would score at the end of the second, fourth, and sixth round, we also are going to score the pikes. So, we'll put that there, and that there, and we will also then have the signet ring. Okay, then we're going to grab Arthur, and he's going to start on the space with the crown right here. And he'll be able to just move around the circle. Then each player is going to get one of these boards, which gives them a place to put their Merlin or Arthur die, which we can go ahead and put up here for now. As you can see, this game can take up quite a bit, quite a bit of table space. We're going to grab the pikes from in here. And then you would go ahead and shuffle these up um, and then grab four to place face up and the rest of them are going to be put face down. Okay. And with that, I'm gonna move this so we have a little bit more space to work with. I do have some room to the sides, but I don't want to get too far off to the side here. I want you to be able to see what's going on. Okay. And that's pretty much 
what changes. Uh, the different action spaces, the pikes, which give you another way to get resources and some more scoring, and an extra die, as, as well as a whole <laughs> separate rondelle. So, there is actually one more thing that changes, and it's the fact that the gray flags and the black flags are going to be replaced with new ones. So, these flags are going to be doing not only not only are they different they serve completely different functions uh, this one allows you to increase or decrease any die roll by one and that's going to also be able to mean you can stay in the exact same place or move up to seven spaces and then the gray flag now allows you to use any die to move anybody so i could use uh, one of my regular dice to move Merlin or Arthur forward or backwards. So pretty nice. And now we are all set up for Arthur. And finally, the Knights of the Round Table. So with the Knights of the Round Table, you're going to take the ones they are in stacks, A's and B's. Each one is going to get shuffled up. And then the player that is the start player is going to get the A's and the player who is last in turn order is going to get the B's. You're going to look through them and pick whichever one you want. I'm just going to grab the top ones though. And then you're going to pass them. So first in turn order would pass them to the second in turn order and last in turn order would pass to the second to last in turn order. So they basically are going to go around the table in opposite directions so that at the end, each player has one A and one B knight. Now each of these knights is going to give you a special ability that could be um, a little bit more persistent or it could be something that just happens a couple times or it could be something that happens a lot. But most of them, I think all but, uh, all but one, one I think, is going to use, oh, none of them are going to use those, uh, is going to use some of these different tokens so we've got Sir Bedivere here, who make, lets this player start with two extra quest cards. So they're going to have six quest cards, and they can use these tokens here to turn in a quest card from their hand for one from there. So they can get rid of one that they maybe just don't want, or maybe they wanted to collect two that round. So they got one that they wanted, and then they swapped one for the one they wanted. And then Sir Tristram here has the ability to manipulate dice. So as you can see, there's got six of these tokens, so it can only be done six times, because every time you do any of the different knight's abilities, it's gonna use their token. So whenever you do discard one of those, you can increase or decrease your die roll by up to two. But you can't go below zero or above uh, six. So unlike this flag right here, you can't end up staying in the same place and do the same action two turns in a row and you can't move seven, but it does give you a lot of flexibility, but it can only be used six times. And then over here, we've got, who's that? This, uh, Sir Gawain. Let's see, where are his tokens? Looks like they're right here. All right. So it gets three uses, but those uses allow you to make either the Merlin or Arthur die, whatever number you want. So three times through the game, you can make Merlin and Arthur move to do exactly what you want them to do. And the last one over here is Sir Percival, who can use their ability eight times. And what that will let you do is, when you're completing one of your quests, let's say I had a black and a gray resource, I can use this to say, all right, I know this one's not the right color, but I'm gonna wave that for this particular use. So eight times they can complete a quest using the wrong colored items. All right, so now we are completely set up using every possible bit that is out as of uh, September 2019. So how do you play the game? Each round is gonna consist of all players simultaneously rolling all of their dice. 
I like to put the rolled dice up here locked in um, and then as I spend them I move them back to where they came from so this is kind of a quick picture of what I've got at my disposal for everybody to see some people I've seen for some reason they happen to like um, putting them there when they're done but I don't think it really matters too much ultimately so starting with the first player they're gonna be looking at kind of what resources they might want to get uh, what they might want to put out here uh, what they've got at their disposal now, all kinds of stuff to try and see what's going to get them the most points. They know they want to repel these traders. So I'm looking here, I've got this guy right here. I, it would be nice to move forward and get a, uh, an orange shield right off the bat. So I could do that. I could also take Arthur and go, because my your pawn is only able to use its colored dice to move forward. So I can only go forward five, forward, uh, forward four, forward five, or forward six. But I can use this Merlin die to go either forward or backwards, the value that it shows. Same thing with Arthur. So with Arthur, I could go one, two, three, and get any building resource that I want. Or I could go one, two, three, and grab the Holy Grail. And when you grab the Holy Grail, you're gonna get an apple, which apples are worth one point at the end of the game, but they also, you can spend them to make a die whatever number you want. And then this is also going to factor in at the scoring rounds. It's going to increase uh, influence to help you win ties and score points. One of the many ways to score points during scoring rounds. So uh, neither one of those is especially appealing to me. So I might say, well, I'm going to wait for my opponent to use their die, hopefully, so that then I can move somewhere else more desirable for me. All right. So what are we going to do? Let's see. Black resource, uh, having them in the gray. I can also flip a die over. But I think I'm gonna go ahead and use this four to go one, two, three, four. Whenever I land on a principality space, I can choose any of my henchmen to go there and do an action. So the builder gets you a building resource. The uh, shield bear is going to give you a shield, which is what I'm going to take. So I'm gonna go ahead and place him there. And you also want to get your henchmen out because one of the things that you score in each scoring round is for each one of your henchmen that's out on the board, you'll score a point. So it's advantageous to get them out and working for you. Um, the flag bearer is going to give you a flag. The lady in waiting will allow you to put influence in that court, which if you have the most influence in an area during a scoring round, you score one point for every influence token that's there. So that just basically locks you in for a point, as well as there's a lot of quests that pertain to that. All right, so those are the four different henchmen, and you could put any of those four out and take a decree if you're using the decree queenie. All right, so that's my turn. Just moved and got myself a shield to protect myself from that traitor. Okay, over here. And we actually have remarkably similar dice. <laughs> so we've got a three and a one, but we also have a lot of quests. So we might want to look at something like this one that's really cheap and get like a seal out here to make it so for the rest of the game, every one that has a builder on it is going to give me more points. And maybe I want to focus on building and the environs, which can be pretty fun. To do that, though, I need to have my builder in the Black Principality, which I cannot do right now with Merlin where he is. So, hmm. What might end up being best for me right now uh, could possibly be using my Merlin die to move him right here, which says wherever there's an I have one of my influence, I can send a henchman to do that action. So I could go ahead and get my shield for this, but I think for fun, just to show you what else is gonna happen, I'm gonna grab a decree. So what I'm going to do is send out my so you do any of these call for anyone in particular? No, not really. Well, then I'm just going to go ahead and send my lady in waiting over there, and I'm going to grab a decree. This gives me a gray shield, which I don't necessarily need right now, but you never know. All right, then we'll come back over here. So I could see what quests might I be close to. What I could do is I could now then take Merlin and move him right back over there. And here I'm going to use one of my Merlin staffs. Now Merlin staffs are worth points at the end of the game, 
But I think being able to complete some quests early on is better than the two points it's worth. Because what Merlin staffs let you do is do the action where Merlin landed twice. So I'm going to spend a Merlin staff so that I can do that action twice. So what I will do then is send out my builder to get a black cube and I will send out my flag bearer and take one of these. That's going to give me an orange flag. And now what I think I might do is use one of my special abilities over here to finish one of these quests. So, um, I'm gonna spend one of these to say that my gray cube is purple so that I can complete this quest. So that'll go ahead and give me two points, or I could put one of my abilities out here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and take the points for now. And then, so I spent a couple things that round and I get a new quest. So what this one says is just have those two people out and about at all. Same thing with this one. So maybe I try and look and decide, okay, which one of these types of quests do I wanna do? Cause the ones with the, uh, the swordsman on it typically deal with having shields out there, but they usually have a little bit or most of the way to do with what they do. <laughs> but I think I'm gonna grab this one right here. And then that refills. All right, and I'll come over here and I want to, so now I've shown you kind of the basic flow of the game. You're gonna use your colored dice to move yourself forward. You can modify with your flags, which I guess maybe I can do that real quick too, just to illustrate. Actually, I was probably pretty close to, what am I trying to finish over here? I think what I'm gonna do is use this four to go one, two, three, four, which will allow me to do send a henchman to where I've got one of my influence. And this time I'm going to do what I should have done before and send my builder because that was one of the things I said I wanted to do. So I'm gonna send him there and again, I'm going to go ahead and take one of these. And it gives me a blue flag, which allows me to move backwards around the circle. And now I have two of these, so I could turn them in for any resource that I want. But right now I'm just gonna go ahead and complete that quest. And instead of taking the one point, I'm going to mark so that for the rest of the game, whenever I do a quest with the builder on it, I will get an additional point. So knowing that, I'm going to go ahead and grab another one that involves the builder. All right, so we've showed completing quests, we've showed a little bit to do with decrees, we showed the Merlin staffs. Let's go and let's, let's try and find a way to build. So right now, one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll go ahead and use a six to move right there. And we're gonna go over here and build. So I have gray and black resources. So I could use my gray resource to do a build on one of these lines here, or I could use my black resource to build on one of those lines there. So the areas that are biggest, meaning they're worth the most points, are these two. I could come over here and get Excalibur, which could be pretty nice. Um, I think I may just do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and build right there. I'm gonna spend my gray resource cube, building material to build right there, and that's going to give me Excalibur. Whenever you get Excalibur, you get to kill off one of your traders immediately. And if you have Excalibur uh, during the scoring round, it also counts as three points. And if you fail to protect yourself from a trader, then you lose three points. So this is, it keeps you from losing three points. And if you are protected from everything, gets you another three points. So Excalibur is pretty darn good. So that was pretty nice. And also now that I have this, I will score three points if I'm still the, the primary, if I have control of this region. If we end up tying, then you split it and round down. And now I'm gonna go ahead and complete this quest because I have each of those out, my sword uh, shield bearer and my builder. So I'm gonna get a point 
or I could do like my opponent over here did and mark so that whenever I complete one of those guys' quests for the rest of the game, I will get points. So I think I'll do that. And I'm gonna grab this next because I will have it completed as well. And we'll refill. All right, so what else can we show? The pipes. So let's see then. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to use this four and I'm going to use my bonus here so that I can move this five spaces and land right there, which allows me to move Merlin, uh, to move Arthur one space. And I'm going to move him right here to get one of these pikes. So each one of these has a number on it and what you're going to get as a bonus. So looking over here, it'd be nice if I got a purple flag. Um, anything else really that beneficial for me? I mean, getting more influence out is not a bad thing, but I think getting that purple flag is going to be what I want to do right now. So not only am I going to get this purple flag right away, during each of the scoring rounds, the number on here determines basically how friendly you are with the pikes. And whoever has the most reputation or is the friendliest with them is going to be safe and actually honored by getting three points and whoever has the lowest reputation with them is going to be attacked and lose three points and that's true even in a two-player game you don't say you know it it's not not friendly or just because there's fewer people you're still going to have one person get three points and one person lose three points so that not only gave me a purple flag which is going to help me with this and help me just in general it's also going to help me hopefully not lose three points Okay, other things, we've talked about apples, we've talked about building. Uh, there's a lot of spaces that allow you to kind of exchange things. So you can exchange any resource for any other resource. This says for every shield you have, get a point. Um, every building you have out, in the, out here, get a point. Um, let's see. Move a henchman to a neighboring principality. This one right here lets you uh, reactivate a henchman who's already been used. So this one allows you to move only one space one direction or the other. This allows them to stay in place and do their thing again. Uh, we talked Excalibur, we talked the Grail, uh, we talk... All right, if you get the Signet Ring, what the Signet Ring will let you do is immediately choose one of your quests and it is now complete. Ta-da, done. You completed that quest. You can still complete a quest by you know, satisfying the conditions, but get the signet ring, you complete the quest, so it's possible to complete two quests on the same turn. So I, now that I've kind of gone through all the different possible actions that I think you can take, um, how you're gonna move around, how you're going to complete quests, how you can use your Knights of the Round Table, how you can uh, use your flags to do kind of different things, move backwards around the circle, flip a die over, move all the way across the circle, uh, the pikes. What I want to talk about now is scoring. So at the end of the second, fourth, and sixth round, you're going to do a scoring. And when you do that, you're going to, um, let's see here, you're going to compare the pikes to see who has the most and who has the least. You're going to look at whether you've defended yourselves from the uh, traitors and if you do or don't, you're going to lose three points. If you have Excalibur and you've protected yourself from all of them, you will get um, an additional three points. You are then going to get three new traders, and then you'll score points for, uh, so right here, like I said, a group of three, I've got the most in there, so that'd be three points. And an addition that's different from the base game, if you um, have the Arthur expansion and you happen to have, like, let's say I had two in there because I tried to be in challenge and I wanted to win that. Uh, I, I have to remove down to only having one in each of those regions. So if there's an, a region that's got like seven in there and I've got four of them taken up, well, guess what? Three of those are gonna get cleared off. So it's trying to kind of keep from one region being over dominant. Um, then you're going to look at the influence going around the table. So right here, there's one influence in there and they're the leader, so that's one point. If there were three in there and I'm the leader, I'm going to get three points. If 
there were four in there and it's a true tie, you split the points. Unless someone's got the grail, then they go, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and win that tie and take all four points. And then you will score points based off of um, how many of your henchmen are out doing their jobs. You'll get one point for each of those. Then at the end of the sixth round of scoring, you're going to get an extra point for each apple and two points for each Merlin staff that you have. At the end of all of that, whoever has the most points is going to be the winner. So, whew, that is how you play Merlin. And now you should have a pretty good idea of how to set up and play through Merlin by Stefan Feld, Michael Reinick, and published by Queen Games. And it's several different expansions and modules that are out as of September 2019. If you want to know more about Merlin, you can take a look in the description section where you can find an overview and review of the game, as well as an unboxing of uh, the Knights of the Round Table. You can also find a link there to macronovagames.com where you can buy hundreds of great games. If you have any feedback for me, please let me know in the comments section below. Uh, if you got any comments, questions, requests, any of that good stuff. And you can also like, share, and subscribe if you like what you see. And as always, have a wonderful day.